So, sorry, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Jude Colligan. I work at Ragmore in the um, respiratory ward, but also do respiratory outpatients and pulmonary rehab. Um, so, it says on the slides bronchiectasis, but what I'm going to talk about um, in this session and hopefully demonstrate is a little bit about the techniques that we might use for our respiratory patients to help them to clear their secretions from, from their lungs. Um, quite often we'll get people referred as an outpatient that maybe have had say, bronchiectasis or chronic lung disease for eight, nine years and had antibiotic after antibiotic, never really get into the bottom of their infections. But part of the management um, of these diseases is that the patients are taught adequate and effective airways clearance. Um, if they're just receiving the antibiotics, um, it clears up for a while, but in, unless they're actually um, get into the deeper seated secretions that are sat on the lungs, then they're not going to clear, clear the infections um, that are sitting there. So it's, it's part of, sort of the, the overall management of, of the disease process. Um, so hopefully over this session, we'll, we'll teach you that um, physiotherapy isn't just take a deep breath and cough. OK, there's, there's more to the techniques than that. And we'll cover a few different techniques. So one called autogenic drainage, which basically means self-drainage. Um, a technique called active cycle of breathing, which is a combination of, of techniques. And then we'll look at a few different adjuncts that we can add into sort of the management of our patients if the other techniques aren't effective. So the first one we're going to talk about is, is autogenic drainage. Um, and that's a technique that was developed by a Belgian physio um, called John Chevalier a number of years ago. Um, it's looking at um, breathing at the correct level. Um, so depending on where the secretions are, we're wanting to focus the breathing techniques at that level. It's also looking at breathing at the right force for the patient so that we're, we're aiming to maximize how we clear the airways, but without causing any constriction of the airways. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to pass everybody a tissue, not to cough up your sausage roll into, but um, just to demonstrate the techniques. So I can pass those around, everyone grab a tissue and pass it on. Might take a while. <laughs> well, so to the impasse on, basically there's a number of factors which influence airways clearance. Um, obviously, we need adequate um, cilia mechanism. Um, so for, for normal individuals who don't have airway disease, we might cough and clear um, little bits of, of phlegm on a daily basis, but just swallow them. It doesn't really affect us. We don't really recognize it, but it's the natural response of the airways, the cilia mechanism to waft um, any sort of irritants um, from the chest. Um, we're also looking at um, the normal um, airways, the nature of the airways. So in chronic lung disease, um, sometimes the airways can become um, uh, collapsible. Uh, they lose the elastic recoil. Um, so as you're trying to force the breath to clear secretions, um, the airways actually close down and becomes more difficult to clear the secretions. So that is when we would maybe add in some of our adjuncts to help to open up the airways a little bit more so we get more adequate um, airways clearance, but we'll come on to that um, in a wee while. So autogenic drainage is a combination of techniques. As I say, we're, we're looking at um, initially, because I can borrow the tissues now, we're looking at how we um, breathe out. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate and then I'll get you all to have a wee practice. So if I was to hold uh, a tissue in front of me, okay, if I get you all to force the breath out as hard as you can onto the tissue. So you're holding the tissue out at arm's length, okay? So slow breath in and a... <laughs> okay, so some of you get a little bit of movement of the tissue, but there's not a huge amount of movement going on. So basically, if you force the, or force the air too much, you're, not, you're going to slow down, you're going to squeeze the airways, and you're not going to get as much airflow through the secretions. Okay? If I was to cough on the tissue, <laughs> again, not much movement of the tissue. So what we're aiming to teach when we're teaching the patient's airways clearance is they're breathing out with enough force that they're going to move the secretions, but without causing airways collapse. So we need to modify the flow so you get more adequate um, clearance of the secretions. If I hold out at arm's length again, I'm going to take a slow breath in. And as I breathe out this time, I'm going to breathe out as if I'm trying to steam up a mirror or a window. So keeping your mouth open and tongue sort of pressed down on the bottom of the mouth, which opens up the back of the throat. So it's a okay. <laughs> so 
try again. So what you'll see is more movement of the tissue. Okay, so we've got a little bit slightly more forceful than normal, but not a full force. We're getting more movement of the tissue, which means there's more airflow through the secretions um, on the chest to help with our airways clearance. Okay. What that means to the patient, I mean, obviously, when, when we're teaching the clearance techniques, we're getting the patient to listen out for any crackling, which will tell them where the secretions are. And this is why taking a deep breath and coughing doesn't always um, work for our patients. So if I take a deep breath, cough, they might clear the secretions higher up on the airways. But if they're hyperinflated, so if their they're shoulders are up here, the chest is up here, they're never actually going to get the air down to the bottom of, of the lungs to shift the secretions. So that is where we might use sort of hands-on treatment to try and help to bring the patient's chest to, down a wee bit to get them breathing down sort of lower lung volumes um, to help to shift the secretions. So we'd start off with the breathing technique first of all. So we'd get them with that breath, breathing out as far as they can, so trying to empty the lungs and just doing like a searching breath. So they're listening out for where the crackling is within the airways, um, which will tell them where the secretions are. And we're getting them to breathe sort of normal breaths in and out through that crackle. Gradually, that crackle position will, will raise so that once the crackle's at the beginning of the breath out, then the patient can cough and clear. But you get a number of, of patients that will cough, 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 nothing comes up. It's not that the chest is, is clear, it's just that the secretions are deeper down on the chest and we're not managing to shift them. So that's where the hands-on um, treatment would come. So if I can borrow her model, borrow Michelle just now, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Not for the belt yet. <laughs> I'll grab a chair for you there. So. Okay, can't do that now. <laughs> so, what we might do when we're assessing the patient, okay, so you talk about a patient with a um, hyperinflated chest, okay, we might put our hands onto the rib cage, and from an assessment point of view, we get Michelle to take a slow breath in in through your nose and then breathe out and you're breathing out and trying to empty the lungs as much as you can and then initially what we might do is put a little bit of force onto the rib cage we're taking her down <laughs> <laughs> how's the sausage rolls <laughs> i didn't have any <laughs> didn't have any okay okay sorry ashley spits out a sausage roll or two okay so slow breath in all the way down so pressure on the rib cage so out, out as far as you can Okay, and put a little bit of pressure on. So we're trying to maximise how far the patient is breathing out. So we're trying to get down to the deeper seated secretions that might sort of sit at the, the periphery. Okay. Once uh, we feel we've got to the maximum, we would keep the pressure on on inhalation. So we're stopping Michelle. If, if Michelle was to take a deep breath in now, we'd keep the pressure on, get to, but hold the pressure on. So we're restricting how far Michelle would breathe in. Okay, and then we let go on the breath out, but you're, do, you're gonna do your forced breath out, so you're not I do, on camera, so. lovely when you take your okay, hands so. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so slow breath in. Okay, and hold the breath and then breathe out. Okay, so obviously Michelle hasn't got any problems with her chest, so <laughs> not hearing anything, but what we're listening out for the whole time is any crackling within the airways, which will tell us where the secretions will be sitting. Okay, so. You, here there, Michelle breathed out a little bit too hard, so you're starting to hear a little bit of a wheeze. Okay, so then we'd modify the breath out with the patient. The other thing we can try if we're getting a wheeze is um, on the breath in, we get the patient to take um, hold the breath for a few seconds. This allows the collateral ventilation to open up, which allows the air to get in and behind the secretions so that we can help to shift them. Okay. So depending on where the infection is, depends on maybe where we, where we put the pressure or what position we might treat, treat the patient in. For, for some of our um, sort of chronic chests, um, a good, good position we get into, so you, you're stopping the hyperinflation, you're um, giving some compression around the outside of the chest, so we might sit behind the patient, pop our hands at the top here and give some pressure. So we're squeezing down the airways just so we're trying to maximise um, getting them to the end of expiration and what we call low lung volume breathing. So we're trying to clear the secretions from the bottom part of the, the chest. Okay, so um, the whole time we're sort of modifying, we're listening out for wheeze, we're listening out for crackles, and it's basically it's retraining the patient, the proprioception of the chest, so they're trying to, to work out where the secretions are so that they can listen to that and get that feedback when they're doing their airways clearance at, at home. Um, sometimes I say you'll get patients that will cough, 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 
and it, it's not that there's nothing there, it's just it's not up high enough. So we would, we'd want really to train them to um, have a productive cough only. So if um, Michelle was taking her down to low lung volumes, there's stuff sat there, the lining of the lungs, it sort of irritates the lining of the lungs, it causes her to cough, but we know that the crackles at the end of the breath out, so we're not actually going to clear anything at the moment. Um, so what we want to try and get Michelle to do is to swallow, take wee sips of water, to suppress the cough. So it's only really when the, the crackles are up in the upper airways will the cough be productive. So you know yourself that some of our patients, they'll be <coughs> coughing and coughing. It uses up quite a lot of energy when they're coughing and it's just going to, if it, the secretions are up or so down too, too low, all it's going to do is push them back down onto the chest a little bit further. Okay, you're dismissed. That's that's fine. <laughs> okay. So once we've established that, it may well be that um, the, the breathing part of the technique's adequate. It may well be that the patient needs some hands-on um, therapy. Um, if they do need that extra assistance to get down to lower lung volumes, then that's where you, know, you might see some of your patients with blue belts that we use. No, anyone? <laughs> no. Okay, Lynn, sorry, can I borrow you a second? <laughs> okay, so rather than the hands-on, could be the bane of my life. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to get you to pop that on. So you've got underneath your armpits there. Okay, so what we would get the patient to do is to breathe out as far as he can. Okay, so breathe out first. And then we're tightening the belt as tight as we can around the rib cage. Okay. So that's fine, you can stay standing. So um, what will happen then is um, as a patient breathes in, Okay, the belt will um, restrict them here, so not be able to, to breathe up here, so not hyperinflating, but it will hold them down at that low lung volume, um, so you can kind of automatically mobilise the secretions from, from the periphery um, and help to, to clear. Um, some of you will be aware, of, obviously, years gone by, we'd use the postal drainage, the percussion, and, and this. But the good thing about this technique is it is kind of user-friendly, so for some of our younger patients, we might get them to pop the belt on in the morning, do what they have to do for sort of half an hour or so, and then sit down and do the breathing elements of the technique. Because with the belt on, with them moving around, they're automatically um, mobilising um, or breathing down at lower lung volumes and mobilising secretions that are maybe sat deeper down on the chest. So it just means they'll get a more effective um, clearance um, when they're, they're using that. Okay, we're dismissed now. <laughs> Okay, so that's, that's one technique, so that's autogenic drainage, um, and we use it a lot in bronchiectasis, we'll, we'll use it in some of our COPDs as well, um, we'll just have to be careful and modify sort of hands-on pressure for, for patients that are um, maybe osteoporotic, um, some patients that may be prone to anxiety obviously don't necessarily like the restriction that, that the belt feels on their chest, but, but we have had some success with patients where we maybe just um, gently attach the belt and then gradually increase the pressure as, as they feel comfortable. Okay, um, next techni technique and one that's sort of commonly um, muttered is sort of active cycle of breathing technique. Um, so that's a combination of, um, sort of breathing control, thoracic expansion exercises, um, uh, FET or forced expiratory technique or a huff. Um, and you can use it and incorporate it with positioning as, as well. So um, for breathing control, um, it used to be called sort of, um, your diaphragmatic breathing, what we're getting the patients to do, again, not very good after lunch, but if I get you all to pop your hand just on the top of your tummy there. Okay. And sometimes what I do, I'll get a patient to pop a hand just on the top of the chest, not on the microphone. <laughs> okay. So you want the hand just to sit just on, on the top of, top of the tummy there. Okay. The hand at the top is mainly just so the patient can feel that this part of the chest shouldn't be moving when we're taking a breath in, okay? Most of the um, function should happen down at the, the bottom of the chest. Um, so what I'd avoid is sort of phrases like deep breathing exercise. As soon as you say take a deep breath, automatically the patients will hyperinflate. So we're asking them to take a slow breath in, okay? As they breathe in, they're trying to allow the tummy to move forward. Okay, so as the tummy moves forwards, that allows the diaphragm to drop down and allows you to breathe from lower down on the chest. 
So this can be used as part of sort of airways clearance, but it can also be used for trying to um, control the breathing um, if the patient's breathless as well. Okay, so they're focusing the attention away from the shoulders and down to the, the diaphragm. Okay. And it may be that they would do sort of three or four breaths <coughs> in one sequence. Okay. Then we've got thoracic expansion or deep breathing exercises, um, and that is where we're focusing the attention on the, the lower part of, of the rib cage. Okay. Um, so we can get a patient to pop hands just onto the rib cage, back both sides. Again, if they're frail, if they've got arthritic problems, it might be more difficult to do that. Um, so we, we might be able to get a patient just to pop the hand just on the side there, so just focusing on one side of the rib cage as, as they do this. We're putting a little bit of pressure onto the rib cage, so just giving yourself a little bit of feedback. And as they take a breath in this time, what you want them to try and concentrate on is, is pushing the ribs out into the hands. Okay, so slow breath in again. You see, and it's not, so some of them will, will bend over so that the ribs are moving out, but it's, it's the breathing and the expansion of the lungs that we're trying to focus on. So um, hands onto the outside of the ribs, slow breath in. <laughs> okay. And so we're about three or four breaths like that. Um, and then the other part of the technique is what's called a forced expiratory technique. So that's similar to what we showed you with the tissue. Um, we were, if the secretions are up quite high, we can force with a little bit more force and um, you'll, you'll shift the upper secretions. If the secretions are lower down, then we want to modify and breathe out to sort of a, a lower lung level to shift the, the lower secretions. Um, the, some, I don't know if anyone's got the peak flow tubes left from this morning. So Sometimes if your patient can't get the hang of the, the forced expiration, uh, we would sometimes use a peak flow tube the opposite way around from this morning. So you were using it for expiratory flow rather than inspiratory flow. Okay, I'm um, getting to patient, sorry? I know, but we can do it out because it's a long way. So I practiced, <laughs> tried it at lunchtime, it does work. So we get a slow breath in, okay, and then we're mouth around the tube and blowing out with a little bit of force. So automatically with the tube in the mouth, the tube will press down the tongue, which opens up the back of the throat, allows them to get a more adequate airflow to shift the secretions. So for some of, even with some of the patients that maybe can't follow the instructions for, for standard techniques, um, some of our dementia patients, sometimes even, even just giving them a peak flow tube and practicing the breathing through the peak flow tube without the valves in it. Um, will um, give them a sort of adequate airways clearance from that perspective. Okay. Um, for some of our um, more chronic chests, I mentioned about airways collapsing. Um, so some of our COPDs, um, maybe they've lost the elastic recoil. We can't get an adequate force without causing airways collapse. That's when we might add in some of our adjuncts. Um, so you may well have seen some of these devices floating around. Um, <clears throat> these are what we call sort of oscillatory PEP devices. So PEP meaning that they give a little bit of positive pressure which helps to keep the airways open. Okay, so for the patients that are wheezy, it would help to keep the airways open for a little bit longer so you can breathe out further and mobilize the, the peripheral secretions. Um, but they also have an oscillatory factor um, and depending on the device, depends on how that works. Um, but what will happen is um, the device will rattle as uh, your patient's breathing out. Um, that will then help to rattle along the airways, mobilize any of the secretions that are sticking um, and help to bring them up into the upper airways so the patient can, can cough and clear. So can I borrow somebody else as a guinea pig? No. <laughs> okay. So this is um, sort of a... Uh, Oscillatory. <laughs> this is an oscillatory PEP device. Um, used to be called a flutter. Uh, different companies taken over the licenses. Um, now a license is a Pario PEP, um, but principles are the same. It's a wee bit of plastic, plastic pipe. There's a cone section which will sit within that. There's a ball bearing which will sit on top, and then the wee gadget on there. The main thing with this is obviously when the patient's using it. 
Um, they want to make sure they've not got their fingers over the holes there, otherwise it's going to lose effect. Um, drawback with this one, um, you have to, it is position dependent, um, so you have to hold it horizontally or slightly tilted up or slightly tilted down and get the patients to play around with the positioning of that until they get um, uh, adequate um, function of the device and the way they, they're listening out for that sort of rattling of the ball within the device if you tilt it up too much it doesn't rattle if you tilt it down too much it doesn't rattle so it's just working out which which angle is um, best for your your patient okay so um, we can get a patient sitting upright in the chair um, with support um, would hold on to the device okay again as I say fingers away from the front of that I'm going to take a slow breath in for your nose and then if you blow out with a little bit of force through the device. So I don't know if you can hear that. So we're slightly more muffled there, so what Kareem might need to do is just tilt the device up slightly. So again, a little bit muffled, so you want to tight tilt it slightly down slightly. So what we're rather than doing like a full force to begin with, which uh, a lot of folk do, um, we want to breathe out with a little bit of force, okay, but not a full force. Um, and that will help, um, with, the, with those breaths, that will help to bring the secretions up from lower down into sort of the upper airways. So, <laughs> they will... <laughs> Thanks for asthma. Um, so what we're wanting, wanting to try and do um, when, they, when they breathe out as well um, is with about five or ten breaths like that, so that's slightly more force than normal, but not a full force, okay? Once, once they've done that, they want to maybe do a couple of breaths with a slightly bit more force than that, and those are the evacuation breaths and the stuff that will, will bring the, the secretions up um, a little bit higher. But we've um, got patients who might be wheezy. Um, it's quite difficult to, to do airways clearance because um, anything that we do which involves force of the airways makes them a little bit more wheezy. So sometimes we would add this into their treatment management plan, and um, a lot of our patients find it um, really effective um, and sort of probably one of the best tools that, that, that they would use. Okay, so that's a flutter device. Okay. We've got an a cappella next. Um, so here we've got sort of mouthpiece. You want to do this one too or someone else? Um, inside this is a wee bit of plastic and a magnet. And basically, um, when you breathe out through this device, it's the piece of um, plastic which vibrates, which then vibrates along the airways. Okay, one good thing about this one is it isn't position dependent. Um, so if you've got somebody that's maybe struggling to um, get the right angle um, with, with other um, devices, um, then it doesn't really matter with this one which position you hold it into, it will still function. I'm told if it stops functioning, it should be held this way up. Uh, if you turn it upside down, it, it functions, um, functions better after a while. Um, so with this one again, we're making sure we don't put the fingers over the, the section at the end. We're a slow breath in and then mouth around the mouthpiece and breathing out with a little bit of force. Okay, one thing to watch, so Kareen's doing it perfectly, but some of your patients, have, their cheeks might rattle as they breathe out, which means that some of the effects of the device will be absorbed within the mouth and not actually get down onto the chest. So um, what we quite often tell, tell folk to do is, is um, have a mirror in front of them when they're practicing at home so they try and minimize the amount of movement from, from the cheeks. Okay. Um, we also have to make sure the patients clean them out afterwards. Um, we <laughs> do tell them, um, but sometimes they will come in and there's all kinds of things growing inside them. So um, they should be cleaned on a daily basis. Um, the device can be taken apart for, for all these devices and rinsed in hot soapy water and then left to towel dry. Um, and they can deep, deeper clean them on a weekly basis. Um, that one. And then we've also got a sort of MediFlow. Um, this can be used for um, inspiration and on expiration as well. Um, so if we're using it for our expiratory PEP device, um, we're using the top uh, connector. If we're using it for inspiration or incentive spirometry, we would use the bottom connector there. Um, so again, we're getting the patient to take a slow breath in. Um, the ball would rise up, okay, as um, 
the patient, or sorry, as the patient's breathing out through the device. Um, and this gives, again, a little bit of resistance, which helps to keep the airways open. <laughs> sorry. Okay, again you can change the resistance on this, so we'd start off with a low resistance and we gradually increase the resistance um, depending on how a patient's um, able to manage it. Things we're looking out for is what we don't want to do is increase the work of breathing, so make the patient more breathless. Um, so we may modify the length of time they're using the, the device for, um, we may incorporate it with other techniques as well. Um, and. Um, as I say, we, we might incorporate positioning into what we're doing from a, a management perspective as well. Um, so with, with that in mind, we'll, we'll come on to just looking at a few different positions, a few patients breathless, a few different positions that might help. Um, I don't know if you want to do it here or sit down. If, <laughs> you can sit down. No, it's fine. Sit down. Okay, so um, we'll talk about, we've talked about breathing control. Um, what we might do... Um, with the breathing control is use slightly different positions to help from a, a breathing perspective. Um, so sitting with your back resting on the chair, as say we've, we've talked about sort of breathing from the tummy. So that's a good position to, to help from that perspective. Sometimes we might get the patients to um, pop their hands placed upwards on the lap. Okay. That's encouraging them to drop the shoulders. Okay. So it allows the breathing to settle down a little bit more quickly, moving in through the nose. Okay, some of our patients you'll find um, will adopt a forward leaning position. I would sort of find patients that would use that, yeah. So um, you've all got tables in front of you. I don't want to put the tables across. Okay, so in the forward leaning position, okay, um, we're giving support to the shoulders. We're allowing the patient to lean forwards, um, we're allowing the tummy to, to move forwards, which gives the lungs a little bit more room to expand, so it just helps to um, settle the breathing down more quickly. We can use it on its own with the table, we can maybe put a couple of cushions on it, sometimes we'll get the patient um, with the, the cushions and the head on the side um, and just um, get them to relax in that position. Some of our patients will sleep in that position because they find it more comfortable than, than lying down. Um, if we haven't got the table, then we can adopt sort of forward leaning. Um, this. <laughs> so forward leaning, arms resting onto the lap in that position. Okay. So again, in that position, we're giving support to the shoulders. The tummy's forward, gives the lungs a little bit more room to expand. So not no one technique uh, works for everybody, but it's just having a catalogue of techniques that we can use with our patients depending on, on their condition. Okay. If they were up and about and walking and um, became breathless, um, then we could um, <coughs> use sort of forward leaning on a work surface, um, forward leaning on a banister. Um, sometimes if they're out in town, there's not many chairs, um, we would maybe get them um, leaning with a back against the wall, plenty of pillars in the Eastgate Centre. Uh, back against the wall, back supported, arms resting by the side, and in that position, um, just giving them some sort of support until they've allowed the breathing to settle down more quickly.